Hi everyone, I'm Vikram. I'm an MPhil student in the chemistry department here. And today I'm going to be talking about some of my research in machine learning and drug discovery. Specifically, all the things that might go wrong in machine learning projects in drug discovery. So here's a brief outline. We're going to start with why is drug discovery hard and why are we interested in using computational approaches in the first place. Then we'll look at how machine learning is typically used. And then we'll look at two particular problems. Can machine learning models generalize? And I'll make clear what I mean by that. And what exactly are these models learning in the first place? So let's start with drug discovery. Drug discovery today generally begins by identifying a target protein that we're interested in modifying, perhaps by activating it, perhaps by deactivating it. We then identify a tightly binding ligand that carries out our desired function and run preclinical tests on cell lines and on mouse models and animal models and later clinical trials in actual humans. This process is known for being time consuming and expensive and prone to failure. And there are a few reasons why. So here's a list of some prominent considerations that we have in the drug discovery process. We want to know whether our candidate molecule targets the protein that we're interested in. We want to know whether it targets the protein with the function that we're interested in. So does it activate or deactivate or modify the protein in the way we want? We want to know that it's specific. So it interacts with the protein we're interested in and not with other closely related proteins. And this is often a big problem because there are lots of very similar proteins in the body. We want to know whether it's toxic, obviously. And we want to know whether it can actually reach the target protein physiologically. So this is a problem for proteins that are inside the cell or inside the nucleus that are harder to reach. The, broadly speaking, the general approach to all of these problems is via screening, which is essentially a trial and error process where we have a collection of candidate molecules and just try all of them and see which ones work best. And we then perform refinements based on domain knowledge and based on our, the results of our screen to get something that might work better. But this is a relatively hard process. For the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to focus on the first and arguably easiest question, and we'll see there are already lots of complications that occur here. So why are screens hard? Surprisingly, it's not entirely because of the cost of screens, because the cost of running a screen to identify a tightly binding ligand is relatively small compared to the cost of running a clinical trial. The big problem is that screens aren't actually very successful. And this is because chemical space, or the space of all molecules, is extremely large and extremely hard to explore. So generally, we only look at a very small space that's accessible to screens in the first place. This space generally consists of a few molecules, around a million or so, that are easy to synthesize and easy to produce, but as a result are generally very similar. And we, it's hard for us to get an idea of what's going on outside of that. So if there are active molecules elsewhere, it's very difficult for us to find them. One of the goals of computational approaches is to tell us what regions of chemical space we might want to look into and what regions are more likely to contain additional actives. However, screens have produced a large amount of data for us. And that's one of the reasons why machine learning approaches have become popular. So now let's talk about how machine learning plays a role. So the first step in any machine learning approach is generally to create a representation of your data. And in this case, the data that we're working with are molecules that are active for a particular protein. Pretty much every machine learning model that's relatively standard uses vector representation. So what we want to do is create a vector representation of a molecule. And there are a number of popular approaches by which you can do this. The traditional approach is to use physical or chemical properties, so things like solubility, acidity, or fancier properties, and then run simple models on them. This works very well if you're working with small families, so closely related molecules. It works less well when you want to deal with all of chemical space because you just can't describe most of that using a relatively small number of properties. The second option is structural fingerprints, which I'll go into more detail about in a minute. It's the one we're going to focus on. The last option is to use overall properties of the 3D structure as a whole, which works extremely well, but generally requires that you know the 3D structure in the first place, which can be computationally expensive. So we're going to focus on the fingerprint-based approach. Fingerprints work as follows. Given a molecule here, we construct all possible fragments up to a certain diameter. Diameter is just the number of atoms from one end to another in the fragment. 
And then we have a mysterious map that maps each fragment to a unique identifier. And these identifiers could in theory be any integer. We then hash the identifiers onto a fixed length bit string, in our case, a 2048 length bit string. The reason we do this hashing procedure is we now end up with a 2048 length vector, which we can use in a machine learning model. However, this hashing process is not one to one, it's many to one, which means that in theory, you could have many fragments that map to one bit, and we do see this happen. You could also have a single fragment represented as different subfragments, so like this molecule has like different subfragments that kind of represent the same thing. So you may see the same fragments show up in different bits of your fingerprint as well. So this causes additional complications further on, which I'll get to. But now that we have our fingerprints, our overall approach is relatively simple. We take our screening data, compute the fingerprints for our actives and inactives, and then train the model and make predictions based off of it. And these models, in general, have been shown to work extremely well on the computer. So they work well when we test them on randomly held out validation sets. But they do not work nearly as well in the real world. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to explain some of the issues that might explain why. So let's start with generalization. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the key goals of using machine learning or computational approaches was to expand from the small region of chemical space accessible to screens to a much larger region of chemical space that we might know about. So it would be useful to test whether we can actually do this. And the way I've developed to test this is relatively simple. We have our training and validation sets. And from those, we hold out a test set that is guaranteed to be a certain distance away from all molecules on the train and validation set. And we can measure the AUC, which is a measure of accuracy, on our held out test set, which is a way of measuring our model's ability to generalize. If our model generalizes well, we'd expect that our accuracy on the validation set would be roughly the same as the accuracy on the test set. If our model generalizes badly, we'd expect the far AUC on the test set to be much worse than the accuracy on the validation set. So we can do this test, and here I've run this for four models on every single protein that's available on a common public database. And what we see very consistently is that regardless of what model you pick or what protein you're dealing with, the far AUC tends to be worse than the standard AUC. And this means that our models consistently fail to generalize. So they do worse at generalizing to this held out test set than they do on a random validation set. So high performing models, so models that perform even very well on validation sets can fail to generalize. So this is something that we should explicitly test for when proposing new models. It's not something we do very often. There are a variety of ways that have been proposed to deal with generalization issues. One hypothesis that was proposed is that the issue here is with data clustering, so clustering of molecules in your data that allows algorithms to get away with just memorizing those clusters. The solution then would be to eliminate those clusters in your initial data, but it turns out that the process of eliminating those clusters also eliminates the ability of your model to learn, so that's not helpful. The approach that I prefer as of now is to get ways of measuring the applicability domain, which is the domain where your model is actually capable of making predictions. So this tells you where your model is and is not capable of generalizing to. And once you measure that, you can make some generalization, and you also know where your model is not applicable and won't make predictions outside of the area where it is applicable. And the best option is, if you're interested in a particular region of chemical space, to just get more data about that region and then build a model for that region in particular. So now we'll move on to the more interesting question of what are our models actually learning? So the question of how do we attribute the results of our model to particular parts of molecules? So attributing uh, for fingerprint-based molecules poses challenges because of the fact that fingerprints don't necessarily correspond to particular fragments. So if I know that a model thinks a particular bit is important, I don't know which fragment that corresponded to because there are many possible fragments for every single bit. So that makes things harder. But we can perform attribution analysis on particular molecules. And the way we've set up this question is that of all of the bits that this molecule has, so of all the fragments in this molecule, which ones are necessary to obtain something close to the score that the model predicts? 
So which ones are particularly important according to this model? And this method doesn't care about any of the properties of the model itself, like differentiability or exactly what type the model is, which is advantageous because we can use it on any model at all. And once we do this, we uh, create a visualization like this, which tells you exactly which atoms are important. So the ones that are colored are the ones that the model thinks happen to be important in this case. So we can do this on real data and get results. But that's not particularly meaningful because we don't know the real rule behind the real data because we don't know what the proteins are actually looking for. So it's better to use a toy data set where we know everything about the data. So the way this toy data set is constructed is relatively simple. So I come up with fragment-based logic. So for example, I might require that my protein bind two molecules with a benzene, a CF, and an alkene. And I specified this ahead of time, and I decided to make this fragment-based so the fingerprints would know everything about it. And in theory, this should be easy to learn because the fingerprints have all of the information available. We then have a background data set that corresponds to something similar to what you would run through a screen. So in our case, we use Zinc-12, which is a data set of all the commercially available compounds. So it's a good representative of what pharma companies might have when they screened. And we then run my activity test on this data set and pick out a set of actives and inactives that represent what you might get out of a screen. And because our fragment-based rules are relatively simple, our models perform very well on this data because there's nothing complicated about it. But now we can try to figure out what they are learning. So we developed an attribution score that is basically a score of how similar our model's attribution is, as I showed you earlier, to the actual attribution, since I know what the actual attribution is, since I set that based off of the fragment-based logic. And we computed this, and we show that even high-performing models pretty consistently don't learn the right rule. So on this graph, we have a normalized attribution score, which is essentially how similar our model's attribution is to the real rule as compared to the far AUC. And we can see that even the models that are doing very well have attribution scores that just go all over the place, depending on the molecule. So this is concerning. And in order to make sure that our attribution scores are actually measuring something real, I generated adversarial examples. These are examples where you take a molecule that the model makes predictions on correctly and then make some minor modifications to that molecule and show that that model is going to now do, make an incorrect prediction about that. So for example, in the case of logistic regression, so the criterion here is that you have a CF, you have benzene, and you have an alkene. Logistic regression doesn't think either the benzene or alkene are very important. So if I remove the alkene, then we get a molecule that logistic regression is still going to predict is active with a very high probability, but is actually inactive. And you can do similar things for all of the other models as well. So this indicates that our attribution results are actually real. Like, this is a problem that will affect the performance of the model if you try to use it in the real world. So now let's try to dissect exactly what's going on and see how we can try to improve our ability of our models to attribute correctly. So the first step is to look at exactly why our models are looking at certain features and not others. And the simplest way to do that is to check, just check which features are most correlated with activity across the entire data set. And what we can see is that the very top feature is fluorine, which is good because I said that CF is required. The second feature is also CF, which is good. The, fourth, the third and fourth features both relate to the CF3 group, which is OK, but not ideal, because I never said that we required CF3, only CF. So it's expected that you'll see some correlation with CF3, but not to the degree we're seeing it here. The fifth feature is alkene, which is good, but we'd like to see that higher up. And then the sixth, seventh, and eighth features all are benzene bonded to a CF directly, not benzene on its own. And this is concerning, because it shows that the model is learning that the rule is benzene attached to a CF, not benzene and the CF separately. You'll also notice benzene doesn't show up at all here. And it actually doesn't show up for a number of the top features. So there are two problems here. There are false negative results where the model thinks a feature is important, uh, is not important, but it actually is. There are false positive results where the model thinks a feature is important, but it's not. It's easier to fix the false negative results, so we'll do that first. 
the way you fix the false negative results is by adding better negative data. So in this case, we noticed that the benzene wasn't showing up a lot. So we added additional data where you had a CF and an alkene, but no benzene. And those were labeled as inactive because they don't follow the rule. And our models then learned that the benzene was actually important. And this significantly cut down on the number of false negatives. So you can see here on here, the original data set in blue and the debiased data set with the additional negative data in orange. And that we have a significantly smaller number of false negatives, which is good. However, first, we can't actually do this in the real world because we don't know enough about the rules that our proteins are following. So it's not a particularly useful solution. And it doesn't actually help your attribution score by all that much. Further, we can still generate the same sort of adversarial examples. They're harder to generate now, but they're still relatively doable, which indicates that our models still aren't learning the right thing. So now let's think about the false positives. False positive results generally tend to come from spurious correlations in the data. So these are correlations where, that are between a feature that we know is important, so like CF, and a feature that's not actually important, like CF3, but end up being correlated in the data for whatever reason. So we can take a look at these correlations here. So here, the upper right triangle is correlations in the data set across the top 20 features. And these correlations tend to come from the background set, so the original Zinc-12 data set. And that's the lower right triangle here. And you can see that these two correlation matrices across the diagonal are relatively similar. Like There are obviously some differences, which you'd expect, because the data set has this additional rule placed on it. But there's also a great deal of similarity. And we can also see that in the scatter plot here that I did of the uh, correlations in the data set versus the background. So this is what we'd like to see because this is what helps the model learn. It's correlations that exist in the data set but don't exist in the background. And those are the ones that are important for the model to learn about what is and is not active. This part is correlations in the data set that are also in the background that are just a reflection of biases that were, are in our original background set. Those are not useful and those are confusing the model. So the false positive results we see are likely from these spurious correlations that were originally in our background data set. So what we want to do now is examine the correlation structure of the background data set to see where are these spurious correlations coming from and how can we account for them and remove them so our models can more accurately learn the correct rule. All right, in summary, high-performing models on a generic validation set might not generalize well. And high-performing models that generalize well may still not learn the correct rule. And in general, because of this, machine learning models on small limited data sets are not going to accurately replicate physics. We're not going to be able to relearn physics from a data set of 1,000 molecules bound to a protein. But we can use our models effectively if we understand where they are and are not applicable. And if we develop a more diverse library as our background data set, and we know that it's more diverse. So we have less bias in our data and are able to do better attribution on our data. And this will allow us to use our models more effectively. Thank you.